afternoon. Uh, who lives in Maastricht? Put your hand up. Okay. So you know this church, and you know that lovely roundabout in front of this church, yeah? How happy does that make you? Think about that. I want to talk about smart cities. I really don't want to talk about smart cities, but uh, as the chap that talked about branding, everywhere I go, somebody's interested in smart cities and logos and branding, and it's a hard reality that we have to deal with. So smart cities are productive, they're efficient. It's all about money. Mayors in the world want their cities to be successful. And sometimes they actually forget what makes people happy. And if you have a successful city, but your people are not happy, then I don't think that's really worth anything. But that's just me. Again, rankings. You've got The Economist, you've got Mercer's. Uh, these are about economic rankings. How successful is your place? All over the world, I see mayors that want to be in the top 10. The kind of ranking that we quite like to look at is Monocles, a small publication from London that talks about livability. It doesn't talk about economic success. It talks about how good is a place to live in. Now, that's more in tune with being happy, because if a place is good to be li living in, the chances are you'll be happy living there. We go all over the world, I go all over the world, and uh, you know, it's great, you meet the mayor, you meet his staff, and they, they ask, what kind of city do you want? And I always say, what kind of city do you want as a mayor? What kind of city do you want as a citizen? Do you want a city full of roundabouts, or do you want a city full of churches like this? Quite simple answer, I think. If you ask me what kind of city you want, I will tell you, but that will be the wrong answer. You as citizens have to decide what kind of city that you want, and then demand the change to make that city the one you want. Otherwise, nobody's going to listen to you. And critically important to this is the notion of a vision. I see too many cities that spend a lot of money in branding but forget about a vision. What's the city going to be like in 5, 10, 20 years' time? Now, unless somebody has a vision like Moses here, you know, the burning bush told him, go to Egypt. So he knew where he had to go. He had his route map. Most cities don't have that. And it's really sad when you see cities that want to be economically successful, but don't understand how to get there. Now, I would disagree that economic successful is really your goal anyway. And this is how I feel when I walk around most cities in the world. The pain of the urban reality. Now, Maastricht is a beautiful city. I've never been here before. It's beautiful in the core. As I drove into Maastricht, I went through the pain. Lots of places like that. Now, whose vision was that? Who asked you if that's the city that you wanted? And it's critically important to understand that that's the question to be asked. Ethel Calvino is a writer that meant something to me, and people that I was discussing with things last night know me now and know that I don't read that much, so for me to have read Ethel Calvino must be quite important. It's important to me. And that quote, I think, is really important to cities. You have to become without forgetting who you are. It's really important to understand who you are. Whether you're a church where a bishop got killed or something else, your roots, your history, your past is critically important to your ability to have a future. I work with people uh, in Copenhagen. Whenever we get off a plane, really sad life that we live, we like to share food, be human, talk to each other, exchange ideas, things that we learn. One of the things that I find really fantastic is that wherever I go, I learn something. Later on, there's a speaker that will show you something which I've learned about, and I have one of these things in my bag, and I will treasure it. So that's been a success for me coming here because I've learned something really important. We talk about placemaking. What's placemaking? It's turning a neighborhood, a city, from the kind of place that you don't want to be in to the kind of place that you ever want to live. It's very simple. Why do we create these kind of places? There are reasons for that. And those reasons, wrong, come back to that. Uh, everything that I do, that we do, is based on research. It's based on 40 years worth of research starting in 1972 with Jan Gale's Life in Between Buildings. We gather evidence about what we see, because too often we go places and somebody says there's a problem. And when we actually look at the issues, the problem is not the problem that they thought. There was another problem. So before we give an answer, we need to determine what the question was in the first place. 
we have urban quality criteria. We assess places against very simple criteria, which is actually quite similar to Maslow's pyramid. If you know Maslow, in terms of his pyramid, we need safety and security coming up to the top where there's beauty and enlightenment. We have a simple methodology which we think is crucial to everything that we do. We start with life, we start with people. We then talk about place and space, and then we look at buildings. Now, we are architects, we love buildings, but if you would start with buildings and then forget about people, you get the kind of places that nobody wants to be in. We're lucky, we get paid to think about cities, and one of the things that's really obvious to me, that a city is a reflection of the culture of the people that created it. So I can understand the culture of the people that created Maastricht. The people that created Maastricht, where are they now? How are they allowing roundabouts and shopping centers and stuff like that to happen? There has been a cultural shift. What is this cultural shift? Who sends a postcard when you go on holiday? Put your hand up. Okay, can't be that many architects in the audience. Why do you send a postcard? It's really quite important. Right? These are four postcards of a city in Scotland called Edinburgh. What do you see? Very simply, you see a castle, a bank, but most of what you see is people's houses, straightforward houses, okay? Who's gonna send a postcard from this Edinburgh? This is the new Edinburgh. This is a compliant city. Every single building there got planning permission, building consent. Now, who's gonna send a postcard from that place? I don't think very many people. So there is something that we're doing that's not right. Four cities and four continents. Nobody can tell me the city or the continent. Four places and two continents, everybody knows where that is. This is not about the architecture. There's something deeper than the architecture here. And you have to think about what that is. I love using this slide with politicians. Insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different answer. That's what bureaucracies do. That's what central government, municipal government does. Right? We do the same thing because that's what we've always done. But we want something different. You need to change what you do. So we talk about placemaking. There are good places in this world, but since about the 1940s, again, this is my hypothesis, we've not made good places, really. We fix things, we do stuff, but the places that we create are not really what they should be. And it's good to have somebody to blame, and I blame the guy that came up with the idea of the production chain, Mr. Ford, right? And it's about being efficient. It's about being really clever at what you do. Now, we have to thank Mr. Taylor for this kind of thought process. Mr. Taylor of Taylorism, of the efficiency movement. This quote is the worst quote I've ever had the pleasure of, the displeasure of reading. Man used to be important, but from now on, the system's important. How crazy is that? Right? Man doesn't mean anything. The system's important. Now, that has led us to develop a methodology of government, which is a production chain. This could be a municipality, it could be a university, it could be a big company, right? We have these silos that do, in this case, good planning, good roads, good economic development, good schools, right? It's very simple. We want to be really efficient at what we do, then we've got to be very specific about what we do. Now, Le Corbusier's plan for Paris is an efficiency diagram. Modernism is a function of efficiency movement. It's Taylorism. Now, who would have sent a postcard from that Paris if Le Corbusier had done that? I would hazard a guess nobody. Now, thank goodness he didn't get to do that. But lots of other cities in the world have been destroyed to that extent in the name of being efficient. So it's like Humpty Dumpty this kind of Victorian English toy, the egg that's broken apart. We're looking for the instructions to put it back together again, but are we? Each one of those silos produces bookloads, tropical forests full of instructions, okay? And then at the end of the process, you're paralyzed. You cannot make the right decisions because you've got to comply with the rules and regulations. The reason the roundabout's out there is because there's some traffic engineer with a computer model that says that's the right answer. Nobody asked the people, and it's a serious issue. It's about false efficiencies. The only, the only way we know if we're successful is if you're on time and if you're on budget. I've been in lots of situations where I've done a project and somebody says, well done, on time and budget. I said, did you look at it? Did you smell it? Did you touch it? No, 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 it's on time and budget. It's a crazy way of looking at it. That solution that you came up with, that design solution, is like a fingerprint. But because of efficiency, we rubber stamp it. 
Therefore, it dilutes the potency of that. It's a sausage machine approach to everything that we do. Put all the ingredients in and out comes out the perfect city. No, it doesn't. You need a bit of love to make things work. There are some good places in the world, but unfortunately, this is about 80 to 90% of what we do across the globe. People's houses, right? These are the kind of environments that we collectively allow. And if we're not careful, these are going to kill us. Who will send a postcard from that place? And then we wonder why we require this kind of technology to make us feel safe. I would suspect that in the center of Maastricht there are very few cameras, but if you go in the periphery of Paris or the periphery of London or the periphery of New York, it's full of cameras. There is an issue. Somebody's telling us something. This is me, the professional. I have spent seven years becoming an architect in the UK. I am a planner. I know everything. I'm the professional. He was responsible for the house, houses behind him, which don't exist anymore. What happens is you go to university, you have a normal brain. <laughs> After seven years, you end up with a peanut brain because you can only do one thing. I can do roads, I can do houses, I can do something else. We forget that we're human. Being human is complicated. No, it isn't. A five-year-old can tell you garbage when she sees it. Now, you're quite lucky in this country that you do not have that amount of paraphernalia related to traffic movement. Lots of places in the world, that's what rules everything that happens. So it's a really confusing situation out there, isn't it? Well, it isn't. It's what Jan calls budget architecture. I'm an architect, so you understand this. You know, we, we fly around the world and we drop our lovely big buildings everywhere. We never actually go and walk the streets or talk to the people about how they feel. It's a crazy situation we're in. Uh, Lucio Costa's Brasilia. As a student, I thought, you know, the master plan, the Spread Eagle master plan was fantastic. Uh, when you actually have the displeasure of walking around it, you realize how anti-human a place it actually is. It looks good as a drawing, but nobody wants to spend any time there. But there are lots of places around the world which are exactly the same, that don't have the label of Brasilia. It's absolutely crazy. This is what we've done. Our cities grew organically. And then they started to expand. I've lost lots of weight recently, okay, because I was going to die. And this is what happens, eh? So your cities grow, and they get really fat and obese, and then the shopping mall and these stuff things, these cancerous growths come, and they strangle your city. This is what we do to our cities because of the efficiency kind of idea. It's what this guy understood. You know, he says, accountants grill get kill great companies. If all you're interested in spreadsheets, you're not going to get right solutions. Accountants are interested in the boring old shit. What we should be looking at is a crazy new shit. How do we destroy the rules and come up with the places that we really want? The other thing that you must remember, it doesn't matter how you get somewhere, whether you're Batman in your Batmobile, a plane, a car, whatever. Normally, most of us are lucky enough to become pedestrians. It's really important to understand that. So cities are for people. We need to understand who and what we are. Six million years ago, we became bipedal. We have a ground speed of about five kilometers an hour. We walk in a forward direction. At that time, once we started to walk, you know, the, there is evidence that shows that our brain started to grow. We, we were able to kill the hog, put it on our shoulders, go back to the village, eat it. The protein intake allowed the brain to really expand. It's the beginning of culture. We have a maximum ground speed of about 32 kilometers an hour. Who remembers that sensation? Come on. You've not been in a swing recently, you need to all go out and go on a swing, right? The reason it's so good is to do with velocity. We go faster than we're designed to go, which is really important to understand because it's very, very dangerous because we're designed to withstand impacts of 32 kilometers an hour. If you go faster than 32 kilometers an hour, it kills you. If something goes past you faster than 32 kilometers an hour, it makes you go like this because you're scared. We're really very simple mechanisms. We walk looking down. Pavements are a recent invention. If you don't look down, you get a bloody nose. So six million years later, we're still soft, cuddly, gentle things. And wherever we go, we notice that cultures are different, climates are totally different, but the way we interpret and use space is virtually the same. At five kilometers an hour, senses are critically important. We have a cone of vision that defines a Panorama of three meters, which is critically important as well. Traders have known this forever. If you want somebody to shop and stop, you make it interesting because you'll slow down and you look into windows. 
We require four stimuli, one stimuli every four seconds. If I'm not giving you that amount of stimulation, you fall asleep regardless. Hanny Jacobson Central Bank in Copenhagen. Fantastic, high piece of architecture, brilliant drawings, Carrara marble. I've been there, I've taken a picture, I'll never go back. This is a side street in Copenhagen. I go there every time I'm there. Once a month, I walk down that street and have a coffee. So that four second interval is really critically important. Historic fabric understands that. Shopping mall designers understand that. I am not advocating the design of shopping malls at all. Wendy houses, who, who knows Wendy houses? They make you feel good because they're designed for the size you are when a child. La Defense in Paris. As a student, I went there, took a picture, went back into town for a coffee. Social distances are critically important. This is me, the preacher. I know everything, okay? So you have to listen to me. But as I get closer to you, you will realize different things. Once you see the white of my eyes, you can determine whether I'm mad or not. I probably am. And it all comes from the distance from the baby to the mother's eyes. That's the way we understand and shape the world. Social field of vision is critically important. At 100 meters, you know whether it's a saber-toothed tiger or a human. At 50 meters, you can tell whether that human has got a club or a sword. Now, you need to be able to understand these things in the environment. Malmo in Copenhagen is designed, and in Sweden is designed for 5K environment. What we keep doing is crashing the 60K environment into the 5K environment. We have traditional cities. If you're not careful, you get invaded cities. Then you have abandoned cities. You need to reconquer cities. Copenhagen's a reconquered city. And one of the things we've learned is that if you tell people to change, they don't change. But if you make it easy for them to change, they will change. And in Copenhagen, like in the Netherlands, people change winter or summer. They make that choice because it's easy for them to do. So one of the things that you really need to understand is that you need to reclaim your cities. You need to tell your politicians that's what you require, because otherwise they won't give you that. And most importantly, you need to have some passion about what you do. Because if you don't have the passion, then nobody will listen to you. Thank you very much.